is as non-root, you can't use it. Okay, the Linux kernel will not allow people to mount overlay file systems as non-root. So one of the engineers on my team, Giuseppe Scrivano, actually went out and copied the entire fuse, the overlay file system and wrote it as a fuse file system. So this is a file system for users. Uh, and so if you're gonna use Builder inside of a container, we don't want to run it privileged. We want to lock down so you know without privilege you can't use overlay. So you have to use fuse overlay. Here I'm actually excluding SE Linux from inside of the container. So all this, all these tests and all these demos will run with SE Linux in enforcing mode, but inside the container we don't need to suck suck in that container. This is uh, excluding a image actually helps you shrink the size because in, in modern Linux systems, and uh, well, when CentOS 8 comes out, they'll have it. Uh, packages that have recommends, um, this is, you know, that recommends will automatically get pulled in, so Builder recommends that you install container SE Linux, um, but if I do an exclude, it'll eliminate this memory size. So, going a little further, the next step uh, we're doing uh, inside of our Docker file here is we're basically telling, uh, in, inside of the underlying libraries that we're gonna use a mount program, and the mount program is fuse overlay. So this line is basically setting up the container images to use fuse overlay by default. Secondarily, oh, oh, jumping ahead. This line, part of the line down here is actually we're gonna go heavily into, as we go through the talk, um, inside of our containers, uh, all of our containers use container storage and inside a container storage we have this concept of additional stores when you use traditional containers like docker containers all the images are stored in one directory what we wanted to do with container storage is we wanted to basically break that apart think about when i'm running containers and anybody that's ever pulled a container right you wait for all this you know all of that root fs that root fs could grow to gigabytes in size so every time you go to a new system, you have to pull down the entire tarball, all the tarballs, to set up your system. So what we want to do with additional stores, we want it to allow you to have a directory on your system that had all the stores pre-exploded. And that directory then can sit on any type of network shear. So if you're going to put it on NFS, you can put it on Luster, you can put it on Ceph, you can put it on S3. You could put it on any type of remote file system. So what we're setting up Builder here is to say, we not only have the traditional where Builder stores its containers, we're also going to look in this secondary directory. These are called additional stores. And the additional store here is going to be stored in BioLive Shared. <coughs> the next step after we set up BioLive Shared is, uh, if you don't mount something in BioLive Shared, then Builder will expect these two files to exist there. So it's basically, uh, so what's at BioLive Shared is going to be an overlay file system, and it expects to have a lock file and a layers lock. So it's just it, without these two lock files, it won't work. The last step inside the builder container image that we want to build is we want to set these two environmental fields. Uh, the first environmental field tells builder to not run inside of a user namespace. We don't want that. We're in a user namespace, so we don't want to go into another user namespace. And again, that requires privilege. And then the last thing we tell it is use isolation based on Cheroot because we don't want, we're in a container, we don't want to set up a secondary container. So these are all the steps we needed to do to set up Builder inside of the container. Now let's look at it happening. So I talked earlier about security versus speed. So one of the things, I've been a security engineer for just about ever. I did SE Linux for many, many years. And almost always I was getting asked by how much performance hit does it take to turn on SE Linux? What is the performance hit of turning that? So almost all questions when it comes to security is always about performance versus security. You know, how much does the firewall add to, to uh, that? Right now we have SecComp people looking at, well, if I turn on SecComp, all of a sudden you know, my performance drops by you know, some minuscule percent, but is that percent important? So anytime we look at security versus, there's always a battle between security versus um, performance. Uh, so we want to, building container images faces the same kind of trade-offs. So we designed Builder 
uh, image to be able to basically allow you to experiment with how you want to run containers inside of your, you know, say inside of your Kubernetes environment or inside of uh, whatever container engine you want. So let's look at some different ways to build containers. So what we're going to do here is actually we built up a Docker file that we're going to run inside of containers. Uh, and this comes up later. So this is sort of a traditional way a lot of people build container images. They usually have a front line, then they have a couple of lines that install software. And it's a very common thing to do this line here, um, either with apt or dmnf or yum. So this is basically telling me <coughs> I'm going to run a container on top of it during my build, and I'm going to install the Apache pro uh, package. And then I'm going to do a dnfy clean all. And what the DNFY clean all does is it gets rid of all of the garbage that gets dropped on that system when DNF installed. This cleans up by live cache, by live, uh, DNF, uh, by live logs, or by log uh, DNF. Uh, so really what it's trying to do is to keep the container as small as possible. Then usually people have random lines of other commands to do, and then they're going to install an additional package and they run that command again. But, right, but we're installing a separate package. The bottom line here is, this line takes a long time, this line takes a long time, um, as well as this line. So we want to basically look at how we can speed up builds um, if I'm running them in, in your container environment. So we're going to totally lock down the system now. We're going to totally run a container as, in as tight of security as possible. Uh, for, for my demonstrations, uh, this, this talk probably should go after the Podman talk, which I have tomorrow. So Podman is a tool that actually replaces Docker. So Podman has all the commands that you, you normally run with the Docker command, um, except that we've rewritten it in Podman. And really cool features about Podman. But I give a talk tomorrow um, at DevConf if you're around at 5.30 to cover this. Um, so we're going to look at, uh, here, here we're going to run a totally locked down container. And I'm going to go through and explain what this command line is doing. So when I run fuse overlay inside of a container, uh, the first thing in Fuse Overlay requires DevFuse, and by default, our containers don't have the DevFuse device available, so I have to run the container with the DevFuse device added to it. Then, I'm just going to run my container, so this is just, remember we showed you uh, the repository uh, for the stable build, um, so that's going to pull down um, that container. And then, I'm going to take the Docker file off the host, and I'm going to mount it into the container. When I mount the Docker file into the container, I'm actually, I, I add this colon Z. For those of you that use SC Linux, the colon Z tells um, the container runtime, container engine here, Podman, to relabel that to make sure it'll work inside of the container. And then I'm just going to execute sort of the standard builder command. And this works very much like Docker build. So it's builder bud as opposed to Docker build, but pretty much the rest of the syntax should be exactly the same. And this says, so at this point, I'm saying I'm going to name my image test image, and I'm going to look for the Docker file and slash. And here I mounted the host Docker file into the container. <coughs> so container start. Um, when I first time I run a container, we want it to start with an empty VARLive containers. Um, so inside of this container, I didn't mount anything from the host, right? So there is no VARLive containers inside of it. It's always good when the presenter doesn't show his own phone number. <laughs> but you put it on snooze, too. Uh, we'll, wait, we'll wait 10 minutes when it goes up again. <laughs> so, uh, so when I, this command here, right, I'm just running a standard um, container image. And container storage gets mounted, it usually gets written to VARLive container. So when I run this command, remember the, the Docker file, the first thing it did was pull in uh, UBI8. Well, that image has to be pulled to the host. Okay? So containers run, starts with an empty VARLive, it must pull down the from image and then populate the DNF database from the from image. This makes it slow. So this is the most secure way you can run containers because we're sharing no content other than the Docker file from the host into the container. So there's no information leak between the container and the, uh, and the host, but it is slow because every time I run this container, it is going to have to go out to a container registry and copy down all of those images into the container. 
right? If you compare the speed to the, of this to running the Docker socket into the container, the first time I run it, if the Docker daemon had pre-pulled the UBI8 image, it would instantaneously be there, right? So when I do this, it's going to be less control. But unlike the, when I have the Docker socket, I can't modify the host's content, and I can't get access to the host via the Docker socket. So this is the most secure way, and this is the way they're currently running um, containers inside of OpenShift. So OpenShift 4.2 currently runs in a lockdown environment, but it runs in a fairly slow environment. So now we're going to look at the total opposite equation. So if I'm going to run Builder inside of a container and I want to run as fast as possible, what I need to do is I need to take the containers from the, ho from the host and mount them into the, into the container. So again, we're going to use Fuse Overlay, but this time we're going to, and we're still doing that, but in this time we're going to volume mount in file live containers in, from the host into the container. This means that if Podman had previously pulled the UBI8 into the is database, then it would be able to be used inside the container. But in order to do this, I actually have to disable SC Linux separation. Because if the container broke out and started attacking, you know, if, if this container broke out and got to file live containers, by default, we don't want to allow the container to write, to read and write content in file live containers. And that's what SC Linux blocks on the system. So what, by doing this um, container, I'm able to now, when I that first from command, if the container image was previously pulled, I will get basically pretty much the close to the, uh, that identical speed of leaking the Docker socket. So this is face fastest because it can share the container's image into the container engine, but it does not because it doesn't have to pull the image to the host. Um, but other container engines can instantly, in, in second literally, when I finish writing my container test image, now any other container that's going to use test image will instantaneously have access to it. Right? So from a security point of view, this is bad because this container image could attack the host, it could get information from the host, and it could write content that could affect other containers later, later running on the system. Right? I can go into that directory, into the BioLive containers, and modify container images on the host and get them to do evil things so your other containers will you know, do evil things on the system. So it's least secure, container storage is shared, we have to disable SE Linux, so now you've lost any protections SE Linux gives to you. Um, but this is still more secure than running the Docker, than running Docker, because you have to get a secondary attack here. You have to basically write something to the container's image and then get a container to take over, um, as opposed to just if I can talk to the socket, I can break out and take over the system. Yeah. I'm not going to do my demo yet. I want to look at the third, the third case. So my demo is going to cover all three cases. So we're going to look at the third case. So that it, uh, if, you, if you follow now, over, over the years I've done these coloring books, and one of the things I'm thinking about for the next coloring book based on this is going to be like Goldilocks. So we have the, uh, you know, the hottest bed, the softest bed, and the medium bed. So what I'm looking for is the, you know, what is the just right uh, from a security and speed point of view. So we mentioned earlier about the, the additional stores. So one of the things I can do with additional stores that we're going to run the container is now, in this case, instead of mounting container storage from the host into the container at BioLive Containers, I'm going to mount it at BioLive Shared. Not only that, but I'm going to mount it read-only. So now I can take the container storage, so again, if Podman has previously pulled UBI8 into the container, in, into its storage, it could share it into the host. So we have a little bit of information leak in that the container can now figure out which container images have been pulled into the host system, but I'm not able to write to that. So I, what happens here is it will write to its own private section of BioLive containers, its own private BioLive containers, but we'll be able to, it won't have to pull down the existing image um, at, at start time. So this is the fastest because it can use containers image previously pulled by Podman. It does not need to pull the images to its own store, um, but when I'm done, I still have to push my container 
uh, image, my newly created container image up to a container registry, and if Podman wants to pull it, it will have to pull it down the host. Um, that's, in my opinion, is a, is a good trade-off because I don't want to have my containers able to cause future uh, problem issues with Podman. You could also have it in a CI CD system where if I push it out to a registry, now you have all your scanners and tools looking at that image before that image gets back into production. So it's very secure because it's totally locked down against the container, right? I didn't have to disable SE Linux to make this to work. Um, I don't have, I have some information leak. Um, you, um, unlike the first example, it's not as quite as, as secure as the first example. I couldn't take advantage of user namespace for this. Um, most, this is most isolated from the host, only information leaked from the host is, is uh, about images. So, uh, if people want to go, there's an ASCII cinema if they want to do this. Also, the demonstrations I give, uh, given my talks, are always available containers slash demos. So anybody wants to go and run these demos on their own, there's a whole bunch of demonstration uh, scripting that actually you can run these demos. So let's... Uh, So it's going to show three examples. First one's pulling the UBI image to the host. So instead of doing the entire Docker file build, I'm just going to do a, a, a pull of the UBI image. So you see here I'm creating a um, storage on the host, but this is storage for the slowest container. This is me typing in my root password, which I won't give you up right now. trying to find it. So I'm going to create slowest, which is just, again, a directory. This is the thing I will mount from the host into the container. I just wanted to set up storage on the host for it. Okay, so now I'm running the podman command that we showed earlier. The only difference here is I mounted that slowest in my live containers, and it's actually pulling now it's actually pulling down the image. So in this case, we're doing a pull of UBI 8. It's going out, actually copying down to the system. And you see here, it took 17.61 seconds to do that. So now I'm going to mount in. Now I'm doing the fastest. So I'm going to mount by live containers from the host into the container. So here you see I'm at disabling SE Linux separation and I'm mounting by live containers of the host. That took 3.7 seconds. So that one that time instead of taking 17 seconds to run, it took 3.7 seconds to run. I'm going to do the same command one more time. Okay, so it took 3.7 seconds because the image was previously pulled to the host. And I'm explaining that. Speed it up. Explain that disabling SE Linux is a bad thing. Alright. So now I'm going to show you the Goldilocks moment. Another director, this time I'm calling containers medium and I'm going to mount, uh, mount containers medium speed. So 
So this is the medium one. In this case, we're doing vinylite containing medium or mounting storage at shear and read only, and then I'm mounting the containers in. And don't tell me we're not the screen. So running at the medium speed, remember it took 3.72 seconds. At the medium speed, it took 3.54 seconds. So again, because it didn't have to move, copy the container down, we can get equivalent speeds with much more security, taking advantage of additional stores. That was a quick demo of So that shows that by taking advantage of additional stores, we're able to get pretty much the speed we wanted with um, you know, mounting the image into that container. So with additional stores, we're able to map, you know, mount the container image into the container. Um, so. When I, when I look at the way we currently build containers and the way people are playing with containers, we're constantly moving these images around the environment, right? We're constantly copying images into uh, you know different hosts. So if you're running uh, you know, Kubernetes, it's copying you know you boot up 20 nodes, you're copying pretty much the same images over and over and over again in the network. We've been dealing a little bit with uh, HPC customers. HPC customers tend to have two things going when they're high performance computing. Don't know what you're at. They have really huge images. We're talking, I've heard images up to seven gigabytes in size. And they also run them on thousands of nodes. So I actually got a request from someone that wanted to run really huge images on 4,000 different nodes. So imagine copying seven gigabytes 4,000 times on a network just to get the container image up and running. As opposed to setting up a really high performance shared computing system, which is what HPC is, and shearing out the images via some kind of network storage. And with additional storage, you can do that. So if you wanted to run Podman Cryo Builder, you can actually set up additional stores and actually set up the NFS or whatever S3 or whatever network storage you want and actually mount that storage in. And you could suddenly have every image in the known universe, inside of your universe, mounted into all your nodes, and any time you run a container, they would instantaneously be there. That sounds good, but there are trade-offs, right? Anybody that's played with NFS, like an NFS-based home directory, has seen the case when the network goes down, all of a sudden their processes freeze. So one of the reasons we don't do this by default in OpenShift up till now is that OpenShift has... Um, you know, a fear of latency, right? If the, if the network goes down, all of a sudden all the containers would freeze up and not be able to perform well. But I think for a really huge use case, doing this uh, with containers, uh, talking about HPC, um, so you can set up any, any of your, you know, iSCSI, S3, SEPs. We, we spent years and years developing Linux to be able to share files, so why aren't we sharing images around the environment? Podman can build a crowd and get instant access to an image without having to pull them locally, and that talks about network hiccups and, and uh, storage. So the last part of this talk, uh, one of the things, anybody here played with YUM and DNF and get really aggravated when it just sits there for like 30, 40 seconds doing absolutely nothing? Anybody know what that nothing is, that it's doing is? It happens more, it's, CentOS and RHEL are somewhat eliminated from this, but if you play with Fedora, it's just constant, constant. So when I do a DNF command, or a yum command, what's happening is uh, the entire, every path on the Linux operating system that's in any package, packaged inside of RPMs, is, is defined in an XML database. Okay, and this is big, if you ever install the package, you can do a yum install, user bin, HTTPD. Right? And the way, so if I execute that command, what happens is DNF goes and looks for that path inside of its database and then figures out that that path is available via the HTTP package. And in order to do that, 
the database has to be updated constantly with the entire XML database. So when I do a YAM update on a system for the first time, it goes out to a registry and grabs a huge HTML, uh, XML, and why it's written XML, it's historical, um, database of all possible paths on the system and then downloads it to the system. After it downloads it to the system and then it takes all of that XML and goes through and parses it. Right? And XML parsing is very, very slow. So that's what's happening before you ever start to see individual packages come down. So that always takes 30 seconds. So the idea I had to solve this problem is to create a new type of volume out. So imagine if you just updated your host operating system and then you're updating, you're running containers builds inside of the same operating system, wouldn't it be nice to be able to take advantage of the previously updated XML database from the host inside of the container? So imagine if, if every time you ran those DNF commands, you didn't have to re-download all the XML. You didn't have to reprocess it because I took the volume from the host that had everything pre-processed and I just mounted it into the container. And then if we went back and looked at that original Docker file that I showed, I show it here. Remember I showed you us doing these commands that you see very commonly in Docker files? Well, the first time this DNF command runs inside of this container, it's going to download that huge XML database and process it inside of the container just to find HTTPD. And then we're good enough to destroy everything we just copied down. And this is the standard syntax for building containers images. Then a few lines later, we re-pull the entire XML database, wait the additional 30 seconds again, and then we wipe that out again. So if you've ever built a container image with three or four or five DNF lines, you are paying that price over and over and over again. And the reason you clean it is because this container line is, runs a, basically creates a layer in your image that is different from this one. If you do this line here and just wait till the end to clean it off, your image will still have all of the content here because what will end up in your image will be the, the bad content from this line and then eventually you'll have a layer that just cleans it out but you'll still have all the other layers will still have the original content. So what I ha had an idea was couldn't we just add a volume mount to a container, say by live, by cache DNF into the container. And we have a, we have an, uh, you know, obviously we could just volume mount it in like uh, with a standard volume command, but I don't want the container to be able to write to the host. So I needed a new type of volume mount to do this. And that volume mount I created is called an overlay volume mount. So in Builder right now, we have a new type of volume and it's called a overlay volume. It allows you to volume mount the directory from the host into a container it is writable inside of the container, but on the host, it's read-only. Okay, everybody understand that? So basically, I'm taking a, you know, what you usually see is like a bind mount. I'm taking a directory from the, from the host, mounted into the container, but inside the container, it's read-only. Not only that, but I have a little separate magic in that it's also a temporary file system. Because what I want to have happen is when the container exits, I want anything I wrote to disappear. And I'm going to explain why in, in a few minutes. So newly written content is destroyed when the container exits. Think of overlay volume mounts as a merge between a volume mount and a TFFS. So what I'm doing with the, with the um, volume mount inside of a container is that it, underneath the covers, it's actually using the overlay mount file system. And when overlay, when, the way overlay works, it actually takes a directory on the host, mounts it, and mounts it, and merges it there. So when I'm using overlay file system, it has a concept of what's called lower DIRs, and then it has concept of upper DIRs. A one upper DIR, you can have multiple lower DIRs. And what the kernel does is it actually merges all of the lower DIRs with the upper DIR and allows you to write to the upper DIR but not modify the lower DIRs. And so you get this merged view of the world. So you have anything that wasn't copied up in overlay. So what we want to do is within, within Builder, basically allow us to mount these images, mount these um, volumes from the host into the container. 
uh, have the upper directory inside of the container and then have the lower show up as read only. Uh, so the, the syntax for doing it now is basically to do a volume out just like you would always do and now we add just a O at the end of the line. So what this does is takes varcash DNF from the host, mounts it to varcash DNF inside the container, um, but this the container can't write to the host varcash DNF. So varcash lower layer, upper layer, if the host varcash DNF is up to date, then theoretically the container, when I run the DNF command, it should start, see that everything is up to date and not re-pull down the the um, image. And this, sadly, this worked very well in Fedora 29. Fedora 30, they made a change to DNF and it's not working, so I can't demonstrate it to you. Um, and right now I'm working with the DNF team to find out what the hell changed um, to, to break this. So DNF still seems to think that there's something out of source, so I have to figure that out. But the, the basic idea here, I think this is a really cool new mount way of mounting and nobody in the world has this and it hasn't gone into Podman or any of the other tools yet. Uh, but the, the real goal here was was to solve this problem. So my, my goal with creating this new uh, mount point is to solve this problem. So if you look at this, this runs a container and it does a DNF install of the, of the image. Uh, and then it will not, because it'll see the host's BioLive uh, bio DNF, it will just pull the HCP package down instantaneously. But I had to handle this problem here. So this problem here would wipe out the entire BioLive cache from the host. Right? If I just use traditional volume mounts and I'll let, you know, turn it off SE Linux, it would allow this, this container to blow it away. So the reason we're using it as a tempfs is when this container exits and this container starts, the secondary container will still have the host file live DNF or by cache DNF in it. And so therefore, this clean all doesn't affect the host at all. So multiple containers. So I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, we haven't really, you guys are the first ones I've ever told about this. So this is actually, there's a blog coming out um, about this new new concept. Uh, the reason I haven't been really shouting it up to the high mountaintops is because it broke, uh, <laughs> or DNF broke anyways, uh, inside of the container. The, the, the basic idea is that we have sort of temporary, you can temporarily mount content from the host into a container. You can modify it, you can look at the content, you can't write to the content, um, and then uh, when you're done, when your container is done, completes, and uh, then the content goes away. And that's all, you know, originally was the concept was to speed up builds, but it's not working right now. So at this point, that is basically the two things that I wanted to do to be able to speed up builds inside of the container. If we can get the second one to work with, with DNF, and I haven't tried it with CentOS, maybe CentOS has a version that will just work, um, then instantaneously you could have the builds going at much faster speeds than you currently have them running inside of Docker. Um, at this point, I'll open up to questions. Anybody have any questions? Oh, was this too technical? Not technical enough? <laughs> What's that? It's after lunch. It's after lunch? Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody want to any try questions? additional stores? All right, well, oh, thank you. Question. Oh, yeah, one, someone's okay. breaking. I was trying to give everybody else an opportunity. <laughs> uh, can you think of any possible changes to DNF to improve uh, that, like some kind of shared cache facility or something? Yeah, it, it's it's funny because I, I actually have a full a few pull requests. And DNF has this. Um, DNF has some really nice hidden features underneath it. Um, to like specify alternate uh, shared directories and things like that. My, my problem is I don't want to have to go into the container and modify the way its DNF is working. So what I need to find out, it, I need to figure out is what it, how is DNF making this? It, it has all its content in Vakash DNF, but it's going out and looking something else in the operating system. And that, that's what I haven't figured out yet is where, where else in the operating system is looking. So I'm going to work with the DNF guys. And I really want to I really want to fix this problem because it drives me crazy. Anybody that's ever used DNF, that, that 30, 40, 50 second, every time you do a yum update, and 
and again, in the Fedora world, it seems like it's constant. I think in, in Rel and CentOS, it's a lot less because the up, you know, there's not as many updates. Uh, but you know, there should be a way for us to optimize that, optimize that way, especially when we go into containers. So yeah, I, have, I have a full, a few different ideas of things I would like to see changed in DNF that we could just have a config file or something. That, uh, D, DNF has a config file that I could potentially volume out from the host, but I want to work with them on, on fixing these issues so we can leak information to those. Yeah, they're, they're working right now on expanding the, the libdnf API right. and moving more of that kind of work into there. I know shared yeah. cache is on it, their list. Yeah, it's, it's one of the top things. So the shared cache stuff is one of the top things on the list to resolve because it will fix a number of other issues all across the stack. Uh, another thing was that there was a contributor who was interested in bringing uh, conf d directories for the DNF configuration so we could do drop-ins to for specific types of configuration. So for example, if we had um, a plugin and a, and a thing that needs to that changes the way DNF behaves inside of the container vis-a-vis -vis cache directories and stuff, those could be configured via the drop-in file rather than modifying the stock dnf.conf. And we can do config merging, overrides, things like that. There's a number of things yeah, um, that we're working would, on for that. One of the things I would like to have with DNF is basically the ability to store multiple operating systems, DNF, side by side. Because DNF, again, assumes that the only code that's ever going to run on this host is for the current operating system. Right. So, so that's... Either, you know, DNF download for R29, DNF sure. download CentOS, DNF download, you know, Right. So I actually do that personally with DNF. I wrote a small tool for downloading and viewing the metadata and doing extra extended actions across different distributions and releases using D wrapping DNF, using distribution DVD keys and stuff like that. It'd certainly be nicer if that was smoother to do. It is definitely possible because you can tell DNF to ignore the host system and operate as if it doesn't exist. It's just uh, not as nice as it, as it could yeah. be. I mean, what I find it is just sitting in manuals, just yeah, looking at code, and trying to figure out how, but it, you know, and, and I, I mean, the DNF guys obviously didn't envision a world where people are going to be- I don't think anybody code. envisioned this. Yeah, but, <laughs> and, and, and so, but DNF seems to be core to this, and DNF, in my opinion, is the biggest slowdown inside of building container. Yeah, we, you know, the additional stores is one thing, but the DNF stuff is constantly pulling down. Yeah, well, yeah. It, what would be nice, I think, from, uh, so DNF has this constant, concept of a persister and a cacheter. And these right. are two separate controls that you can configure from the DNF conf file. Um, one thing, or through the CLI by setting the setup right. flags, if they were pointed outside of the container and they were being used from outside the container area, you don't even need to do DNF clean all anymore. And those would just be constantly reused. And so that is a feature that's available. It isn't exposed properly through the Python front end. It is available inside of the the API and you can manipulate through the config, right. but uh, there's definitely some work to be done there. But as far I, as I just need those things exposed via the CLI, because right. again, I'm not gonna. But uh, I'm, not I, writing, I'm not writing code here. All I'm trying to do is make things get happen. The dumb line. Yeah. Like we have that dumb line inside the container to be fooled enough to, to do smarter things. That, yeah. You know, um, I, I can this show you the little wrapper tool that I wrote for letting me do different distributions pretty easily for. Yeah. Querying and it would be trivial to extend it for the use case that you want. Right. Um, and then, I mean, if I could, it, it, even if your tool, I could, you know, all of a sudden that now the Podman command says, oh, I'm building a CentOS image, so I'll mount in my life. Yeah. Cent, and by DNF CentOS, blah, blah, blah. Right. At the point, and boom, it's instantaneous. So gets it. And I just envision a cron job on the host that once every hour, once every day, whatever, fires up and downloads all the DNF and does all the pre processing for me. So now see builder nodes will constantly have sort of the like right. I would love, I'd love to have some people will look to this and say, well, why not just set up a um, you could set up a caching repo in front of it. But even that That's more expensive than it than is necessary in right. most cases. You really just need the metadata most of the time and then you download on demand the packages. Right, right. Because the packages are totally random. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I agree with you in this case. Yeah. Um, I can show you what I have done so far and it, I'm, I'm certain the DNF people as well as myself would be interested in in fixing those use cases um, within the DNF stack uh, going forward for this because it's definitely something that people are using more of and I see no reason that that can't be advanced. Yeah. All right, well, 
thank you very much. Uh, just so um, I wanted to, I, I didn't put them up on slides, but there's a good ready talk tomorrow morning on new features that have gone into the tools since last year's DevConf US. Um, actually, it's Friday morning at 9 o'clock. Um, I give a talk that covers Podman. Basically, it's called Replacing Docker with Podman, and that happens at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. Um, lastly, there is a containers boff that we just scheduled tomorrow at, I think it's 10 minutes to 2. Um, so if anybody wants to just come and talk, there will be a lot of talk at that one about C groups and uh, C groups B2 that's coming along for, uh, well, it's available right now and sent to us, uh, but no one uses it. And we're going to talk about why no one uses it and how we're enabling it. The next version of Fedora, Fedora 31, is going to come to fault with C groups B2 turned on. Uh, so. Yes. Um, and that's you know, that's my suicide pack right now. <laughs> I'm going to support this. I'm going to be thought support. Of, I, I won't be thought of the same way as Leonard when he introduced System D. After I mean, you let go of the label when you introduced SC Linux. So oh, yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> I've been the bad guy in the past. So I could. But anyways, thanks for having me, and uh, hope to see you guys tomorrow. Some of the Thank you. Dave.